In the grand scheme of things, Extreme Championship Wrestling burned very brightly for a relatively short period of time. In that time, however, the promotion managed to make many memorable moments that have stood the test of time thanks in large part to the aura of the stars it helped create. The Sabus, Rob Van Dams, Ravens, Tazzes and the like were bona fide stars in ECW and beyond, but there were plenty of wrestlers who bled and sweat in that sweat box of an arena in Philadelphia that didn't quite leave the same legacy and may have been lost to time despite their best efforts. I'm Adam Pacisi from Cultaholic Wrestling and these are 10 ECW stars you don't remember. Join us! Number 10, Uganda. A spin-off of Kamala, what gave it away, Uganda was brought into ECW for 21 matches during the second half of 1999. A mainstay of All Japan Wrestling, where he wrestled as Giant Kimala with an eye, Uganda hadn't had a great deal of exposure to the US audience outside of the occasional match here or there, including a loss to Eric Watts on an episode of WCW Worldwide in 1992. ECW fans were first introduced to Uganda on the August 21st, 1999 edition of Hardcore TV, which opened with highlights of him beating Spanish Angel and Kid Cash in separate matches. A week later, he was seen squashing Tom Marquez. Evidently being pushed as a monster heel, Uganda was built up so that he could be knocked down by two of ECW's top stars. First, he unsuccessfully challenged Rob Van Dam for the World TV title in a competitive match. Then, the barefoot brawler did a 23-second job for giant killer Spike Dudley, which was his cue to return to the land of the rising sun. Real name Ben Peacock, he would continue to wrestle in Japan before retiring from the business in 2005. Number 9, Ikuto Hidaka. ECW always seemed to have close ties with Japanese organizations and were able to bring in stars like Atsushi Onita, Masato Tanaka, Hayabusa, The Great Sasuke, and others at their peak. In the winter of 1999, the small battle arts promotion sent a promising rookie on a learning excursion to the land of the extreme, presumably in the hope it would give him the sort of seasoning and exposure it had provided fellow Japanese export Yoshihiro Tajiri. Ikuto Hidaka wrestled 11 matches in total between November 26th and December 18th, three of which were televised. Two of those were against the dependable Super Crazy, a complimentary opponent for the high-flying Hidaka. Bursting onto the scene and dropping jaws like Rey Mysterio Jr. had four years earlier, the ECW fans immediately embraced him. It was hard not to marvel at the speed and crispness of Hidaka, who was just a couple of years into his professional career at that point. He only got a few opportunities to show the American audience what he was all about, but he made the most of it and left the Philadelphia faithful wanting more. Number 8. Ulf Herman Ah, Ulf Herman. How difficult it is to say your name and not immediately follow it up with the German. Herman worked in his home country and around Europe during the 90s, gaining experience in different territories and even earning a WWE tryout match as Herman the German, naturally, in 1992. WWE passed on him, but Ulf made his way to ECW in 1998 and aligned himself with Lance Wright and his short-lived The Wright Connection stable of unofficial WWE stars like Two Cold Scorpio and, um, Bracus. On television, Herman was primarily used to put over other bigger stars, such as Sabu, and he did a couple of very quick jobs to Spike Dudley, which was basically a rite of passage for anyone over 6 foot 4 and 250 pounds who found themselves in ECW at that time. Herman's one other highlight was a short TV title match loss to Rob Van Dam on an episode of Hardcore TV. All told, the one-time member of the full-blooded Italians wrestled 31 ECW matches, only a few of which were televised, before his jaunt to the USA ended and he returned to the Europe scene. Number 7. Prodigy and the Prodigette Well, if you don't remember Prodigy, the odds of you remembering Prodigette are pretty slim, aren't they? Right, so Prodigy was a repackaged Tom Marquez and… you don't know who Tom Marquez is, do you? Tom Marquez was an indie guy from Puerto Rico who worked a handful of matches for ECW over the course of a few years before securing a regular gig in 1999. He was essentially a solid hand used to put others over before being given a bit more to do as a member of the stable The Sideshow Freaks. That group was managed by the Prodigette, aka Angel Orsini, a female performer who had been active on the worldwide indie scene. 
The Prodigets only worked a handful of matches, including a victory over Jazz and a mixed tag loss to Simon Diamond and Johnny Swinger, but stuck around until the bitter end. Unfortunately, she missed the very, very last ECW house show after being injured in a car accident. Post ECW, Orsini, using her real name, had a decent career on the indies while Marquez worked here and there before sacking her off in 2005. Number 6. Antifaz Del Norte Though former WCW Vice President Eric Bischoff will no doubt happily tell you that he introduced Lucha Libre to the American mainstream, it was actually Paul Heyman who gave the likes of Rey Mysterio, Juventud Guerrera, Psychosis and Conan their first real shot in the US. ECW would continue to draft in the occasional masked Mexican talent afterwards, though that was easier said than done with WCW and WWE having first dibs on the best ones. One high flyer who got a look in was Antifaz del Norte, aka the Mask of the North. Of note, he had televised matches against Tajiri and a debuting Super Crazy, as well as a couple of outings against Little Guido, one of which took place at the 1999 Guilty as Charged pay-per-view. Most of the matches he had were decent enough and he clearly had talent, but perhaps there wasn't enough to distinguish him, even if he was more than happy to throw caution to the wind with some truly reckless dives. Curiously, his ECW swan song was a non-televised ECW world title match loss to Taz, following which he he went back to working south of the border. Number 5. Tommy Cairo Because ECW became so popular as the ultra-violent anti-establishment cult promotion of the mid to late 90s, people tend to forget its pre-extreme life as the NWA affiliate Eastern Championship Wrestling. Eastern Championship Wrestling had a whole other roster and a bunch of stars that fans of the table-breaking revamp may not have heard of. For example, Tommy Cairo, a former professional bodybuilder who became one of only two men along with Tony Stetson to hold the ECW Pennsylvania Championship during its fleeting five-month lifespan in 1993. The most memorable thing Cairo did during his ECW tenure was feud with the Sandman. Their personal rivalry saw them start as partners before drawing in woman and Sandman's wife, Lori, aka Peaches, and leading to various matches revolving around the so-called Singapore Canes. Iron Man Tommy Cairo wasn't a dynamic promo and didn't really do anything flashy in the ring, but his contributions to the early days of ECW should not be overlooked, and he was one of the hottest wrestlers in the Northeast independent scene of the day. Number 4. Skull Von Crush Skull Von Crush. Seriously, why didn't he just name himself I'm a Scary Tough Guy? Grrr. The owner of this menacing moniker was none other than a pre-dress wearing Vito. A student of Johnny Rod's, Vito had wrestled in Memphis, Puerto Rico, Japan, and done some jobs for WWE before getting his shot in ECW toward the tail end of 98. Used primarily on live events, Skull Von Crush had a couple of decent matches with world television champion Rob Van Dam on Hardcore TV, but he failed to really stand out from the rest of the pack. He was a solid enough hand and worked hard, but didn't have much of a character, which is presumably why the ECW Brain Trust decided to let him go by his real name and added him to the Baldy stable. The Italian-American slaphead certainly fit the part, you know? After feuding with New Jack, Vito left ECW for WCW after taking the pin in a Loser Leaves ECW tag team match. All in all, he was in the land of extreme for about a year. Forget about it! I already did, mate. Number 3. Sal Bolomo Another cult favourite from the pre-extreme days of Eastern Championship Wrestling, Wildman Sal Bolomo was a long-time journeyman grappler who was probably best known for being a technically sound WWE jobber during the mid-80s. When he rocked up in ECW in the early 90s, he was considerably heavier and sported a massive beard. He also wore new gear that made him look like a homeless Roman centurion and completely changed up his wrestling style, swapping headlocks and hip tosses for frenzied brawling. Before New Jack, Balls Mahoney and the like made it their calling card years later, Belomo was the first ECW star to truly take the action into the audience and use everything in his vicinity that wasn't nailed down. He never won a championship in ECW, but he did receive a few cracks at them, including in a tournament final for the vacant ECW heavyweight title, which was won by Jimmy Snooker. Sal wrestled for ECW between 1992 and 1994, left and then came back for a couple of matches as a member of the FBI in 96. What he lacked in finesse, he made up for by being entertaining and unpredictable. Number 2. Rod Price The Price is right, more like the Price is Rod. Am I right? 
Rod Price, that is. All right, so we may be stretching the definition of the term star here a little bit, but Texas mainstay Rugged Rod Price did wrestle over 50 matches for ECW in 1998 and 1999. Price was mainly used as an enhancement talent to put other bigger stars over and only appeared a few times on TV. Like many a follically challenged member of the hardcore crew, Price was, inevitably, made a member of the Baldies. Not for long, mind, because a month after his last tag match with PN News, Rod Price said goodbye to Extreme Championship Wrestling. We probably didn't get to see the best of Rod Price in ECW, as injuries, in particular a serious one to his neck, had taken their toll and would soon take him out of the ring for good. In his prime, he was actually pretty damn good, and a lot of people say that he could have been a bigger deal with better timing and the right push. Unfortunately, when it came time to round out his career in Paul Heyman's promotion, he was more or less filling up a place on the card. Number 1. Mac Daddy Kane No, this isn't an alter ego of Glenn Jacobs where he became a pimp, although that is definitely something I would have watched and I'm now sad never happened. No, no, no. Mac Daddy Kane was another WWE star who briefly cut his teeth in Paul Heyman's promotion. A solid six years before showing up on Raw as three-minute warning member Rosie, Matthew Anna why he was working in the small halls of the northeastern United States alongside his uncle Samu, aka Sammy Silk. Together, they were the Samoan Gangster Party, arriving in ECW in the summer of 1996 to challenge for the ECW World Tag Team titles. Sammy was clearly the captain of the ship, having already been in the business for 14 years working for major organizations like WWE, WCW, and New Japan, while Mac Daddy Kane, also known as Big Matty Smalls, was looking to make a name for himself. It didn't quite happen in ECW, as the duo stay lasted just four months and ten matches, though one of them against the non-Samoan gangsters at Heatwave gained a measure of infamy after the Island Boys were bludgeoned with weapons in a brutally one-sided short squash match that ended via referee's decision. 